Welcome back to another video ranking all vehicles in Cyberpunk 2077. Today, we're breaking down all 20 Phantom Liberty exclusive cars, comparing speed, acceleration, endurance, weapons, design, and more, in order to ultimately decide which is best, before adding them to an overall tier list alongside the 38 cars from the base game, which I covered in the last video. So let's kick things off with the worst car in Phantom Liberty. Down at the bottom then, this spot clearly belongs to the Makagai Tanashi T400, thankfully provided for free by Mr. Hands upon entering Dogtown for the first time. Allegedly designed to be the perfect bog standard vehicle to navigate the wastes and wreckages of the district with the most verticality. Except the thing is, thanks to Air Dash and said verticality, there really isn't ever much reason to use a car around Dogtown, and if there is, you can do far better than this. With just a top speed of 95 and taking 12 seconds to go from 0 to 60, this ain't getting you anywhere quicker than your legs can carry you. Though it does at least have some reinforcement for protection within the savage region of Dogtown, with tyres that take 3 hits to puncture, just over 4 mags of Dying Knight to the engine to explode, or 2 arm projectiles make it, to be fair, tougher than many sports cars even. It's also a very user-friendly car, with off-road suspension, relatively intuitive handling, and is pretty easy to see out of, if you drive in first person. Not terrible qualities by any means, and it's free regardless, but collectively not enough to keep it out of D tier alongside the starter vehicles from the base game, which is kind of poetic. An uber reinforced Thornton Colby next, and that description pretty much sums up this car. Slow, heavy, and used around Dogtown as a standard troop carrier. We can buy ours from Autofixer for 29,000 eddies, but truly I wouldn't bother unless you've got money to burn. Like it's relatively reinforced, at least the chassis is, but no more so than many superior cars across the game. Whilst this gunner hole in the top clearly is screaming for some kind of companion or even multiplayer integration. A cool design feature for sure, but this car to us is nothing more than a relatively high endurance wannabe and one with no weapons. And now that I think about it, it literally is the lowest form evolution of the far more expensive trail bruiser van or hellhound vehicle higher up this list. With a top speed of 103 and 10 second 0-60, this falls in line with the Colby Butte, though to anyone who enjoys driving first person, all the more reason to stay away. Visibility is minuscule and there's a very contained and awkward shooting angle which weirdly isn't a problem in the third person camera. Still, cool that we can roleplay a member of Bar Guest, I suppose. Finally, an actual decent vehicle produced by Makagai that doesn't have to rely on the hilarity meme factor that bumps up the Mai Mai. The Kuma takes the concept of the Tanishi being an all-terrain off-road vehicle and fully leans into it, becoming the closest representation we have to a Jeep in the game. Again, it's not really fast and accelerates with just a little bit more conviction than its base counterparts, but when it comes to climbing hills or navigating bumpy terrain, it performs with zero complaints, and would be, could be, an ideal candidate for general badlands exploration if significantly faster cars didn't exist that also excel off-road. The open top nature at least though provides almost maximum visibility for a first person view, though that's not exactly as important when the fastest you'll be speeding along in this thing is 102. Endurance wise there's no improvements on the base version, though having nothing but a roll cage around you will of course increase susceptibility to gunfire for you the player, so not exactly optimised for combat. I don't know. If this were some grindy desert exploration game, then I would happily cruise around in this thing for hours. But since it's a high quality, action packed, story driven piece, there's really not that much cause to fork out the 35 grand needed for this one. Unless, of course, you're a big fan of Jeeps. If the Alvarado Delegate is the car you drive as a mob boss at the height of his power, then the Herman is the car that any mod boss who chooses quiet life over blaze of glory eventually moves onto, still giving that essence of look at me, I'm the shit, but now with an overtone of I'm also picking up the kids at four. Not that our version would be capable of that specific feat, given the boot space is entirely seatless and more optimised for transporting our old rolled up rucks, as Reyes would describe it. With a top speed of 112 and 0-6 
360 in 9 seconds, it doesn't win any points on speed. Though to be fair, nor did the original Delegate. However, something interesting I did notice is this car's particularly high resistance to explosions. Not a bad quality to have when you're playing the role of a mob boss, especially one with a family. All for the relatively reasonable price of 39k, just one more than the Delegate. So the choice is yours, pure head honcho limousine, or would you rather some station wagonness thrown in too? Both with the same horsepower, though the Herman is a little heavier, resulting, no doubt, in the slightly fewer top miles per hour. Whilst the Merrimack Warlock might not be able to boast much in terms of raw speed, acceleration, or even for that matter its toughness, which was surprising, there is one front on which I can massively defend using this thing. It has great handling all round, both on road and on. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that this is one of the best handling tanky cars in the entire game. Not the tankiest for certain, but still very pleasant to drive. Whilst I may not have ever been able to exceed 120 in it, I always felt in control turning corners ramming other traffic, or even navigating hairy combat situations that required a half focus on the road itself, knowing that if I lost control, I would quickly be able to regain it. And despite the less than admirable on paper stats, provided you don't get swarmed by enemies, it still stood up surprisingly well in combat. Now here's an interesting fact about the Warlock specifically though, whilst it was originally a car from Australia, it still somehow sports a right hand driving configuration. Whether or not that was switched when imported, or an original factory defect that potentially led to its fortuitous deportation is unclear, but I do think it's kind of a shame, especially given the seating orientation of cars where I'm from too. For once, it would have been nice to actually have a car with the driver's seat on the right side. It would have felt familiar at any rate, and probably would have buffed this car into B tier on that unique feature alone. Still, it handles exceptionally, but for 43000 I'd save your money for faster or weaponized cars if you're in a pinch. This Australian feet of superior handling can wait. Next up, the Delion Vindicator is one of the worst cool looking cars in the game, meaning whilst its statistical scores all serve to land it right the way down here, it still definitely wins several points on preemness alone. At a price of 36k, this thing will give you just 117 miles per hour in speed and a 0-60 of 7 whole seconds. Endurance wise, it's in the same ballpark as the Alvarados and Cortezes, but again, beats both of those in the cool factor, I'd say, even though both of them are designed to be sleek majestic looking vehicles too. Visibility wise it's fine, and the interior actually looks like that of a regular car, a pretty snazzy one too. And this is very much the sales pitch from within the game itself, with the regular model of this car allegedly being the irresistible preferred lift of choice for hitchhikers everywhere. And the Vindicator specifically is supposed to be a car you'd get pulled over in simply because the officer wants to get a picture with it. Not that this is an encounter that ever happens to me, but hey, be cool if that's actually a hidden detail they'd programmed in somewhere. So comment below if you've ever come across that. Otherwise, if you're for whatever reason wanting to drive the best C tier vehicle in the game, then this would be it. The purest definition of style over substance. What do you need to do with the second worst vehicle in the game, formerly the worst Mahir Supron, to buff it all the way into B tier? Well, first, you need to give it heavy armor, double reinforced tires, and a good explosion resistance. Then, you need to slap guns and rockets on the thing. And finally, to compensate for it all, swap out the engine for that of a big Villafort Columbus fan. This is what Barges did to create their military edition of the Mahir Supron. Our specific model, however, was stolen by some dude with balls enough to cross Kurt Hansen, who once again modified it to sport some decent off-road suspension. Yes, it may still only reach a top speed of 101 and take a ridiculous 14 seconds to get to 60, but with this thing, you can survive cosily tucked away inside right up until Netwatch disabled the vehicle, sending out volleys of rockets alongside rounds of front-mounted gunfire. What's more, the thing is so slow, you're less likely to have accelerated into your forward-fired rockets by the time they hit the ground. Though the other side of that is that you can't get away if firing too close. Interior visibility really isn't great, much of the view is obscured, but to be honest it's a pretty badass minivan to look at from the outside anyway. But are the guns, rockets and protection really worth a 94k price point? Or is the thing just too slow to justify that? Well, that's down to your discretion, though bearing in mind it's one of the last to unlock on autofixer, there's a high chance you'll already have acquired something better than this beforehand. 
first real sports car on the Phantom Liberty list now, and the Hazuki Haseki can be bought for 37,000 eddies, for which you'll get a not amazing top speed of 127, but a decent 0 to 60 of 5 seconds, or 22 to reach 120. As a Mitsutani car, it is of course sporting features of sportiness and badassery, but according to the database, Mitsutani's whole idea behind the Hazuki model was to bring the cars down to a more user-friendly, fun for the whole family kind of thing. Not that there's much of that left in this heavily modified version we get, which was transformed by a corpo named Adrian Mayer to take on the Badlands racing circuit. Yep, this family sports vehicle has practically been modified into a dirt racer, though perhaps Adrienne should have invested a little more into the air filters, as she died of pneumoconiosis shortly after. That, by the way, is a lung disease caused by breathing in certain particles, probably irradiated sand dust. In fact, her plaque can be found at the Columbarium, with the quote inscribed, this is how you live. Nice to know she got to enjoy a bit of life outside the corpo work grind at least, and now we can honour her legacy by enjoying the car. Which to be fair, speed aside, it has the same sort of aesthetic appeal as the likes of the Quartz Bandit. Certainly nice to look at in third person, though first isn't terrible either, aside from the banner across the top. Unless you're planning on wowing the enemy with Haseki's look though, fair warning, it won't last too long in combat. More just a cool dirt racer, this one. As though Quadra didn't already have one car with enough unique variants to acquire. In Phantom Liberty, they added a second, the Quadra Sport R7. Four different variants, each with their own merits, and the Sterling specifically reminds me of a shark, because of the grey and the spoiler kind of makes me think of a fin for some reason. Though it foremost of course is a reference to the show Archer, hence the name Sterling. Bitting that the fixer from the spy thriller expansion would reward us with a spy car at the conclusion of our business. This one is of course awarded by Mr. Hands after completing all of his gigs, and the only reason it's the lowest Sport R7 of the list is due to its comparatively marginally worse stats. Sterling has a top speed of 158, a 0-60 of 4 seconds, 14 for 120, and is generally very pleasant to handle on the road, whilst making you feel like the high-class suit sporting spy that you are. Though don't expect this one to come with any of those spy car bells and whistles. Toughness is very mediocre, and you'll have to rely on your own gun for any combat. Though to be fair, they can often be more reliable than front-facing machine guns or slow to reload none too accurate rockets, even with the smart targeting. And for completing all the Dogtown gigs, which are brilliantly made enough to be a gift in and of themselves, this mostly serves as just a pleasant cherry on top. Sadly though, it's a no-go for first-person drivers, with just the smallest slither of visibility, and thus is another one that you'll have to appreciate externally whilst you drive. If you want the closest thing to a tank that you can get to keep in this game, which is still totally inferior to a tank despite being the most expensive vehicle in the game now, then maybe, just maybe, you'll want to invest in a Hellhound for 160,000 eddies. These are the vehicles rolled out by police any time you hit a 4 star wanted level, making them second only in toughness to a max tax squad or netwatch just straight up disabling your vehicle. On the receiving end, they tend to shred through any car we're driving in a fight, so acquiring one for ourself is a decent way to level the playing field. Guns are on the front rather than the side, which makes them more accurate against further away targets, and rockets of course are rockets, something you want to fire only at vehicles far enough away from you lest you use up this thing's explosion resistance. Still only handling two arm projectiles, bizarrely, but seemingly more rockets fired from vehicles, and in fairness, driving over any landmines in this doesn't set them off at all. Not many use cases for that feature, though there are a handful. Aside from that though, tyres are completely unpoppable, and you can sink over 5 dying night mags into the chassis before it explodes, unsurprisingly. Honestly, it's not too dissimilar from the Supron Trail Bruiser, but does very much feel like an upgrade, with a higher top speed of 122 and a 10 second 0-60. Definitely not designed for speed still, but that bonus manoeuvrability is important, especially when swinging it round for shooting. Unlike a tank though, I found this is not the best at rolling over everything, and in fact, suspension can oftentimes make this one tough to control, compared to some of the other sturdy vehicles we get to own. Don't get me wrong, still very much an absolute powerhouse, just not quite an unstoppable force. And also, I don't know if it's just my graphical settings, but any bright day in this thing it was impossible to see out of, literally. So no points for interior view either. Worth the hefty price tag? Well it probably is the toughest combat vehicle in the game and will take you to 5 stars easily, but the problem with getting there is Netwatch will just 
disable your vehicle at that point. And this isn't the only one capable of surviving that long in combat. Despite the fact that Dogtown really isn't a place requiring a car to get around easily, that of course didn't stop the Cassell twins from renting out a fancy ride from Caron Exotics upon their arrival there. The Sport R7 Caron is yet another of the Sport R7s, only this model is slightly older, beating the Sterling just in speed, interestingly, and accelerates to 120 a few seconds faster, though has a 5 second 0 to 60 as opposed to 4. Not tremendously noticeably different stats though, unless you were keeping tabs like me, and endurance wise the two were identical. Getting this one though I would argue is significantly easier than completing all of Dogtown's gigs. Spoilers for the fire starter and moving heat Phantom Liberty quests, so jump to the next timestamp if that's a problem. Basically, after Reed and Alex kill the Cassell twins and we commandeer their car, it's going to remain stored safely in lockup. It being a rental however means Car on Exotics want it back, hiring a netrunner named Ashley to complete the job. Someone who fortunately for us will have a much easier easier time if the car simply disappears forever rather than getting retrieved. So if we can just reach it, they can wipe it from the system and make the car permanently ours. It's a great little sneak in stealth mission and fun extra side quest for Phantom Liberty. Just drive carefully when taking this thing out of the garage, after which you'll see the unique feature of this funky little car. Trust the Cassell twins to hire something with some fancy holographic projection of literal flames on the bonnets as the car accelerates. Kind of makes me hope that in a sequel we will get vehicle customization and that this type of thing can be one of those bonus decorative features. Moving into A tier now, and the Thornton Colby Vulture serves as the final evolution of this car. Similar, but better, even than the Little Mule, and representing the pinnacle as to what a Colby can become in this game, with exactly the same defensive stats as Little Mule, but an increased top speed of 147, 0 to 60 in 5 seconds, and 0 to 120 in 20 seconds. This really is a fantastic car before even accounting for weapons, whether you're driving off road or on. Throw in the fact that this not only has machine guns but rockets now too, and for 56k I think that may be the cheapest rocket car in the entire game, far less than the slower Supron Trailbruiser especially, which despite being more heavily armoured, actually performed no better combat wise in practice. And that one is ridiculously slower than this. Little Mule got nerfed a bit in 2.0, and now I'm beginning to wonder if it was simply to allow the Vulture to shine all the more brightly. Much like the Hellhound, this thing will easily get you up to 5 stars, though unlike that knockoff tank, this one actually has a pretty good shot of running away when Netwatch starts to triangulate your position. A method which, yes, really can work. Though whilst this car is pretty great in every way, handles decently as well, there are better contenders in all departments still yet to come. Second place in the ranking of Sport R7s now, we have the Vigilante, a car which canonically was the last work of iconic Quadra designer Georgia Barbaris. And with an exposed engine of pipes and metalwork, this one is clearly as much a work of art as it is a vehicle, dark, brooding, and giving off the same sort of tones as Robert Pattinson's Batmobile, a car I previously likened in appearance to the Type 66 Avenger, which still holds true, but this car more exhibits the feel. And with a far higher speed of 172 and better horsepower than both the Sterling and Caron, as well as a brilliant 3 second 0 to 60, about as good as it can get for most cars, and 0 to 120 of just 9 seconds. Visibility, again, has the exact same problem as all the others, but again, this is fortunately a pleasant one to look at whilst driving, and even packs a little explosion resistance on top. Those who pre-ordered the expansion will receive it for free, canonically having won a lottery that V didn't ever enter, whilst otherwise you'll have to fork out a fairly steep 86 6k on autofixer. Not worth it, in my opinion, if you're tight on eddies, since the best Sport R7 is actually cheaper and, well, better, mostly. Safer on the immediate acceleration fronts and, well, being red. In A tier, with the Colby Vulture then, is also the Thornton Galena Locust. And these two cars are basically the rocketed up versions of the Little Mule and Galena Gecko, top evolutions of what started out as two of the worst cars in the game. But why does the Locust sit marginally higher here? Both cars have a top speed of 147, and the Locust is actually a more expensive 60k, with lower durability than the Vulture. However, this thing is so much more nimble than that larger car, with a very fast 3 second 0-60, 
and an okay 13 second 0 to 120. Far as swinging the vehicle around to continuously face the way you want to shoot, the Locust wins out on that just about, easily becoming the superior choice when it comes to car chases, and is one of the most agile Badlands cars. The most agile, with rockets, arguably. But somewhere I'd still probably choose the Vulture over this would be in the less chasey, more stand and face your enemies fights, since Locust's durability actually really isn't great in that regard. Armed with the firepower to get you to those high stars, though not really equipped enough to survive them. Honestly though, with the way your car gets hacked by Netwatch at 5 stars, the long term strategy often becomes constantly summoning new vehicles and hopefully having enough to keep it going on the 5 minute cooldown cycle. The Locust then is certainly a great one to include in that lineup, with great speed and power, not to mention a decent interior view. Pretty good considering the exterior one isn't nearly as pretty as most of the cars up here. Interestingly, if you are going for pure speed, then the OG Galena Gecko is still gonna just win there, slightly. But I mean, 3 mile an hour difference or rockets, what's it gonna be? Speaking of Badlands rocket cars though, there's two up here in S tier which absolutely dominate, with high but justified price tags to go with that. The first is our Shion Coyote rocketed variant, the Mitsutani Shion Samu, costing 87 grand on autofixer and rocking all the same durability stats as the regular Coyote, but not the same speed. In fact, speed has dropped all the way down from 170 to just 153. Heavy price to pay for rockets, though potentially worth it if you prefer vehicle combat combats over straight up getting around the Badlands quickly. Besides, if I'm off-roading somewhere not anticipating a fight, it's more about enjoying the design and feel of the vehicle in question. And believe me, the Samum is nice. Same as the Coyote, basically. Just brilliant off-road traction, a pleasantly bouncy suspension, and yes, it's 0 to 120 is a whole 15 seconds, but it's a nice 15 seconds of this car roaring into life. The same roar you'll incidentally get with the faster Coyote. Still on the fence about which of these two I'd place higher, there's of course pros and cons on both sides, but you know, I think Coyote is still just about king of the Shions, with this a very close runner up. And now we come to the king of Quadra Sport R7s, just about. The Chiaro Skiro costs just 81 grand on autofixer and hits a very high top speed of 175, one of the best in the game. Losing out to the Vigilante with a 4 second 0 to 60, though matching it with a 9 second 0 to 120. Really minimal differences here though overall, and endurance is indeed identical. In fact, aside from paintwork, I'd go so far as to say that there's really nothing in it with these two cars, with even the exposed engine being a core feature of both. Interestingly, scanning this one brings up the same anecdote about designer Georgia Barbaris and her final work of art, again mentioning the furious red factor, which this car clearly isn't. My only assumption, therefore, is that this instead is the model branded as too grim, brooding and extreme. And yes, you can see why it was given that description, especially when being released to a consumer market. But as the rocker boy possessed, absolute demonic unit that V is, prowling around Night City in this thing feels more than fitting, and personally I much prefer it to the Vigilante. Sure, one may be named after a person who takes up the mantle of judge, jury and executioner, whilst the other is an artistic term for contrasting light and shadow, but I didn't know that second one until I looked it up. So to me, Chiaroscuro can just be a dark and foreboding name for a dark and foreboding combo of the Vigilante and the Sterling. Now, here's a car whose design I instantly fell in love with, arguably more so than Herrera's main vehicle, the Outlaw. The Herrera Riptide Terrier is one of the absolute fastest cars in the game, clocking in at 185 with a 0 to 60 time of 4 seconds and 11 to hit 120. Interior visibility is also great, thanks in no small part to the awesome design by which you enter this vehicle. That being to have the entire front open up like popping the bonnet on an engine and then close down in front of you. Awesome. It's a real futuristic, yet at the same time retro vibe which I feel fully belongs in this setting, and hopefully more high-end vehicles will make use of it come Orion and beyond. It's kind of like a new take on what the DeLorean was doing back in the 80s, having simply lift up doors, which if I'm not mistaken is the feature that landed it the role of the time machine in Back to the Future and immortalised it forever as an iconic car. And yeah, the Terrier feels somewhere between the DeLorean and maybe a Ferrari. Endurance wise it's okay, reinforced rear tyres and some explosion 
resistance, but really nothing special there. And why should it be? This ain't a car for combat, it's a car for racing and just looking futuristically retro and cool. Cruising around NC in one of these will set you back 108k though, and in my game at least, it was the last vehicle to unlock from Reyes Just Another Story missions. Definitely a later game vehicle this one, but one of the standout new designs for sure, for Phantom Liberty. You just might want to brush up on some drifting skills before making it your be all and end all vehicle, because this thing, same as the Hoon, really likes to drift. The Archer Quartz Sidewinder, a car I originally planned to place in second on account of it being the fastest rocket car, though after driving it a fair amount, the side windiness became overly apparent, and in spite of its weapons, the ease of which we can control the subsequent two cars place them above this. Not to mention the fact that the Sidewinder's side mounted guns do not have the same accuracy as the closer together guns on the likes of the Whaler same. So for 90,000 eddies on Autofixer, what does this one give you? Well, a top speed of 160 is a very nice start, with 0 to 60 in 3 seconds being even nicer, and 0 to 120 in 8 being yet nicer still. Interior visibility ain't great, and looks wise it is just a badlandsy looking quartz, the bandit still wins on the quartz appearance front, but in terms of being a speedy, all-terrain vehicle sporting both missiles and machine guns, you'll struggle to find another vehicle that can do all of these things quite that well. Just again, be careful with the control aspect, as this thing loves to drift, almost too much, and be careful too about getting stuck shot at for too long. Shouldn't be a problem considering the thing's speed, but like endurance wise, it's nothing to get excited about. Basically just the spectre that was added to the 2.0 base game, only sporting more firepower, a green paint job, and of course rockets. In fact an unweaponized version of this vehicle has been in the game since day one, and I hoped back in 1.6 that we would one day be able to own one. It's kind of nice that that's actually come true. We now come to the final two. Both of these cars, I would say, are the absolute best in the game, beating everything from the previous video of base 2.0 vehicles, including both the Caliburn and Hoon. On balance, I mean, Caliburn still wins in terms of speed with the Erendite coming in at second there, but again, after 2.0, and Phantom Liberty especially, speed ain't the be all and end all when it comes to cars. So in second place is the Herrera Outlaw Whaler, a car brilliantly earned for free via a side quest unlocked by completing car thefts for El Capitan. Eventually we'll be landed with the slightly more developed quest, Baby Let Me Take You, which is pretty straightforward, just clepping a large goods vehicle, but afterwards we will be gifted the whaler, taking everything great about the standard outlaw and improving upon it in every single way. With a similar but ever so slightly higher top speed of 177, 0-60 of 3 seconds and 0-120 in 10, those are some really good stats, but where the whaler truly shines is in its now fantastic combat versatility. I'm talking bulletproof tyres, literally unpoppable, and crystal dome tech to defend you the driver from taking damage. Yes, this one only sports guns, no rockets, but it's still an improvement on the regular outlaw which had nothing and yet was one of the most enjoyable cars to drive in the game. The insanely slick handling and responsiveness make cornering easy, even at high speeds, and that same degree of accuracy extends into the front mounted machine guns, which are a lot closer together than on most cars and actually provide the very very practical advantage of reduced bullet spread. Look, this thing will still blow up if it fights for too long, but so will everything else. And another thing the Whaler excels at is barging its way out of hairy situations, with the same horsepower as the regular Outlaw, which when combined with some heavy gunfire is practically unstoppable. Basically, just do yourself a favour and rinse the car missions until you unlock this thing. It's definitely the best free car we can get in the game, and with it you can probably get away with never buying another car again. Again, not that that's going to stop us, not quite. Finally then, the absolute best car when you weigh it all up, in my opinion, well that'd be something sporting similar iconography to the Hoon, albeit with greater speed and yeah, that's about it. And according to my research, many of you were struggling to obtain this when Phantom Liberty came out, but I'm pretty sure that's fixed now. Just as well, considering where this vehicle is sitting on the ranking list. With a top speed of 185, the Wingate again doesn't quite beat the Caliburn or even Arendite on that front, but does just about take the title 
total of fastest Type 66, beating even the Javelina. Couple that with the fact that Wingate can handle any type of terrain, save for the hills of the scrapyards, and that makes it a more convenient vehicle overall. No rockets on this one, but just like the Hoon and Javelina, it does have guns. Not as optimally mounted, to be fair, as they are on the Whaler, and to be honest, which wins out of these two is a toss-up of personal preference. Both have a similarly great handling I found, though Wingate would win off-road, whereas Whaler would win on. Wingate does have that edge on raw speed, of course, and acceleration, going from 0 to 60 in just 2 seconds. I think that's only matched by the Caliburn, and hitting 0 to 120 in a mere 9. Points do get docked on the interior visibility fronts, I think the winner there would be the Terrier, but according to my recent poll, that isn't tremendously important for most of you. Durability, again, is similar to the Hoon and Javelina, but actually beating both with the ability to handle one extra projectile. All this for the same price as the Javelina, and it's a no-brainer, as far as I'm concerned. Obviously, it can't beat the Hoon on the wonderful tribute that that car is to Ken Block, but otherwise, the design is remarkably similar, just faster and more blue. Hoon is of course free, so nothing lost on getting that anyway, but if you want something slightly superior driving-wise to compare it to, and the overall best car of the game averaged out across all conceivable situations, then buying the Wingate is a great choice. And if I could only purchase just one of Autofix's cars, it'd be this one, easily. But let me know in the comments if you agree with that sentiment, or if there's another car on that site that you're more in a rush to spend your hard-earned eddies on. Perhaps you think the free Whaler, Hoon and Caliburn are all you need, and that buying cars is a waste of money. Luckily, I'll be topping this new series of rankings off with all seven bikes in 2.0 fairly soonish. And if you're watching this a few weeks after release, then I've probably already finished it, so go check it out. Huge thanks, as always, to the amazing Patreon supporters for keeping the channel alive. Things are starting to slow down a lot now after Phantom Liberty, and your support provides that extra layer of security for me to keep doing this full time. Finally, thank you for watching. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you soon in another video.